Welcome to the ninth episode of the L&D Go Beyond podcast. Today, we have Vincent Han with us. Vincent is the founder and CEO of Mobile Coach, a B2B SaaS chatbot authoring platform. He talks at various industry events and is a leading voice in the learning technology space with an emphasis on artificial intelligence and chatbot technology. Before Mobile Coach, he has founded several other successful technology companies. While his background is in technology, Vince's passion lies in learning and performance. And I'm very happy to have Vince join us today to talk about chatbots in workplace learning and performance. This is a topic I am very keen to learn more about and who better than Vince to talk about that. Vince, very welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Amit. I'm, it's an honor and a privilege, so I look forward to our conversation. I'm so looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, before we get started, Vince, uh, would you like to share a little bit about your journey uh, and what, what excites you today? Yeah, thank you. Um, so let's see. Um, I'm trying to, I'll try to keep the short version <laughs> of my story, but um, uh, the short version is that I was actually a music major in, when I was at university. And when I graduated, uh, this was in the 90s, um, someone forgot to tell me that it was very difficult to make a living as a musician. <laughs> so I um, quickly pivoted into the back then in the 90s with the internet boom. I was fortunate enough to, uh, even with a music background, attach myself to a couple of technology companies and just fell in love with the whole process of imagining technology and then tackling the challenge of building it and having it be usable. Um, so that started my career in um, the tech world. I was able to get an, um, an MBA at uh, the MIT Sloan School of Management, which helped uh, me learn the things I needed to do that I didn't learn studying music. And I quickly developed a passion for um, developing technology that really helps people progress. Um, you mentioned my passion around learning and performance. You know, that's absolutely true, whether that's in the workplace or in our personal lives. So many of the companies I've started um, are focused around self-improvement mm -hmm. um, and things like that. So, um, and so personally, I reside in the state of Utah in the United States. I'm an avid outdoorsman. I love to run and camp and hike. Um, and so I have uh, four wonderful children that are all adults and out of the house now. And so it's a really interesting stage of my life. Oh, fantastic. What a lovely journey. I, I really like the you know, pivot that you took uh, from music to technology to MBA. Uh, and, and the focus now is on self-improvement. I actually saw one of your posts on LinkedIn recently about you completing a, a marathon in under was it three hours. Yeah. Yep. I, oh, uh, a couple was... weeks ago, I was able to run a marathon in two hours, 52 minutes and 54 seconds. Oh, so I was very, very, that's very amazing. happy. I worked really hard for that. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Amazing. Do you still practice some music? Yeah, I, I do. Not as much as I would like to, which is, which is uh, too bad, but I do play um, the piano and um, the trombone from time to time. And um, especially with my family, I have several musical family members and we like to get together and enjoy it together. Wow. I'm sure that will be fantastic when you do that with the family. Brilliant. Thanks for sharing that, Vince. Uh, that's really, you know, uh, great to know the background and, and what's the story. Uh, let's get started with our topic, which is about chatbots and learning and performance. So I, I think this is an area which is evolving. It's been evolving for some time. It's been kind of on the horizon as one of the trends. Uh, but really, I don't know if a lot of people really know uh, about chatbots or understand them well, or if they have really implemented any chatbots. So why don't we start with just understanding what are chatbots? And why should LND be interested in them? Yeah, so that's a great place to start. Um, people may not know this, but chatbots have been around for a long time. The, one of the first documented chatbots was um, developed in the MIT Media Lab in the in the 60s. So that's uh, you know over 50 years ago. Um, and you know humans always have this fascination around: can a computer be like a human? Um, and of course, that's depicted a lot in the movies, um, where of course, and, and of course, 
uh, many of the artificial intelligence type of bots or personal assistants that we have today are nowhere near how smart they seem to be in the movies. Yeah. So we got a long way to go. But I think the first sort of point is that humans like this idea of can a computer have a conversation mm -hmm. with a human and um, and would there be benefit to that? And so I think that technology has has slowly been improving to find where that's actually useful. And where most people have had experience themselves is um, actually pretty simple where, um, uh, you know, sort of I'm thinking of a customer service use case where you go to some website and a chat window pops open. And sometimes it's not even really a chat bot. It's just several buttons that you're clicking and trying to, you know, solve your own problem as a customer to get some immediate help. So I don't have to wait on the phone for half an hour. That's a really nice use case for uh, conver automated conversation online. For where L and D should be interested in in chatbots, um, you know, I think that another type of automated conversation with a computer is not on a website per se, but on our mobile devices. So one of the biggest challenges that L and D folks have is how do I reach and engage my learner audience? You know, they're not reading email. We struggle getting them to our learning management system or whatever learning portal we've created. They're busy, and maybe they don't even appreciate the, the importance of learning. So that's, that's a big major challenge. And, and a chatbot on a mobile device is a really frictionless user experience. So you can have a chatbot talk with people on WhatsApp. You know, we're all, you know, we're on WhatsApp all day long or SMS all day long, or even on Microsoft Teams, where it's not, I don't have to go somewhere for a learning experience. It's already where I, I already am. So if I'm already chatting with colleagues in Microsoft Teams or chatting with friends in WhatsApp, and there's a chatbot there, then that opens up a whole world of possibilities for an instructional designer to say, now that I have that connection with that learner, can I program a chatbot to help that person learn and progress? And it not necessarily waiting for the user to talk to the chatbot, but actually have the chatbot initiate a conversation. So I think that idea there is where is why I think L and D folks should really take a look at this technology because the the possibilities to help solve their engagement problem are really really endless. Mm -hmm. Let me go back a bit and uh, just just check with you again on because you said the the customer service uh, engagements that you have on websites uh, may not be called chatbots. So are you calling them something else? Are they like <laughs> a text-based IVR or what, what are you trying to, you know, differentiate? Yeah, I think, well, I think technically they are chat bots or maybe bots is a better term. Okay. You know, it's because as you mentioned, this is a trend and with trends, there's a lot of things evolving and innovation. And so, so one of the uh, difficult things when you're in a trend is what, what do we call things? How do we have a, a natural language? And so, that technically a chatbot is a conversational user interface. So you're having a conversation, um, which means either, either with audio or through typing or texting. It's just that as chatbot providers have found, okay, how do we make the user experience easier? They have found that on the web, at least by creating buttons, that's just a little bit easier for users to click instead of having to type. And so a lot of those automated bots are more button based um, but plenty of them still um, support actual conversational user interface too but that also uh, does it hint at you know maybe a difference in evolution of technology also because a button based thing is is you know at the back end is essentially a branching and you are kind yeah. of going down the branch but a text based thing could be almost free you know a user can respond in a, in a way that the chatbot doesn't understand, or it has to do more effort to understand because it's not really following a certain branch. So in a way you can, is, is it the right way to say that those chatbots which will have those buttons or menu that is given are kind of, you know, on the primitive stage of the evolutionary cycle and the ones which are understanding what humans are saying are possibly more evolved that are technologically advanced. Um, yeah, I think I think that's fair. Although um, I, I believe, like for example, um, the platform that I have created, the Mobile Coach platform, mm -hmm. we support both, and it really 
ends up being a design decision. Um, it's less about, to me, it's less about rudimentary um, versus sophisticated, more about how do we make things easier for the user. So for example, um, in our platform, uh, instructional designer can create a button-based menu, but also support open text, you know, natural language parsing. And so the user can really choose what they want to do. Also, it's very, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very common that um, those types of web-based experiences are blend in human support as well. You know, so for example, if I'm a customer and I have a very complicated issue, I know intuitively that this chatbot is probably not going to understand my issue. I actually want to talk to a human being. Mm -hmm. So most chatbots do or should um, allow for that handoff to happen. And so, yeah, so there's, I think the best chatbot experiences have a blend of all of them where mm -hmm. you have some buttons that might be convenient. It allows for open text for that convenience and sophistication, as well as giving me a path to talk to a human being. Hmm. Okay, that makes sense. All right. So the other point that you uh, you know brought up when you were responding to the initial question was LND should be excited about being able to meet the people on mobile, and because that's where it is, uh, people are more responsive. They they can you know and. Maybe they feel it is more personal. It is more directed at them. It is on a device that they are more comfortable with. You know. So, are there any reasons that you think why people are more comfortable, you know, responding to such things on a mobile? Because you know, in some of my previous conversations, there have been uh, challenges raised around. Oh, it's my personal device. You know, why should I be using it for anything related to organization? So, is there kind of a you know? Uh, overlap between these two sort of situations. Yeah, I think that um, it, it, that's a that's probably the biggest design and policy decision an organization is going to have to make. Interestingly enough, COVID has really accelerated the maturity of some of that those policies because mm -hmm. of this huge work from home initiative. Where you know maybe before COVID, when people come into the office. There, there were large swaths of employees that were resistant to use their phones or anything work-related. When they started working from home, it was sort of inevitable, you know, in, in order to, you know, stay connected, um, people started needing to use their phones, which I thought was interesting. So th there's, that, there's that sort of um, trend that's happened. And also uh, with the pandemic, the reliance and adoption of workplace collaboration platforms uh, like Microsoft Teams, like Slack, WebEx Teams, you know, going on and on, really exploded. And that was actually a nice solution for organizations and employees because, you know, I can download Teams on my phone and then control how I use it. So I'm not getting work through my WhatsApp, for example, where WhatsApp might feel very personal to me. I don't really want work there, but I'm happy to have teams on there because I'm working from home and I understand I need to be connected somehow. So, you know, I think that's been a nice compromise for organizations. I will also say that organizations, large organizations, rightly so, have to be sensitive about, um, you know, privacy and, and um, security protocols. And so workplace collaboration platforms like Teams give the enterprise more control over security. Um, so it makes them feel 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 good about that. So that's some of some technical reasons why I think there's some nice solutions to to solve that dynamic that you describe. However, I also I, I want to make the big point that I, we I have found that even the employees that might be initially resistant to having a chatbot that's work related chirping at me through Teams, or I'm sorry, through WhatsApp, or in the United States through SMS. If the messages feel valuable to me, then that's then people are fine with it. Mm. If they feel invasive, if they feel um, like they're unwelcome, then you know people are not going to be fine with that. So it really comes down to: can you design user experiences that um, that help? I'll give you an ex uh, example. So where where this dynamic plays out the most that I've seen is with part-time employees. So let's say a part-time employee that's working for a fast food restaurant, for example, they're getting paid hourly. There's no benefits, you know, they don't want to have, you know, so there's, in, in some laws here in the United States, you really actually can't have 
um, you know, uh, using their, if they're using their phone, maybe you have to pay them for the time they're using their yeah. phone. So there's some sensitivities there, but those people will, will on their own use text messaging to text the manager to say, Hey, I'm sick. I can't go to work today. You know, they'll, there are cases where they want to use it. And so yeah. you find those use cases where, uh, you know, let's say a chatbot could handle that for you. Yeah. Let's say that a chatbot over SMS in the U S could handle scheduling then it's all of a sudden not going to be an issue because the employees want the convenience of being able to um, use their phone to, to help them in their personal lives. And so I do think there's a whole umbrella of use cases where employees who might otherwise be resistant to using their phones would be very happy to use their phones. Mm. Uh, what you're probably suggesting is finding a, a business use case and then anything related to maybe learning and performance can be clubbed with that. That would be easier because... Yeah, everybody is okay to use it for business because it helps them as well. Hmm. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. All right, uh, let's move on to the next point. And this has been on my mind, you know, ever since we decided to have a chat. <laughs> is that you know a lot of chatbots are essentially FAQ based, you know, and that's probably easier to create. And and if, again, I'll use the word evolved, but an evolved version would be. Uh, something which can learn on its own. So are we really seeing the movement from FAQ-based chatbots to more sophisticated, uh, intelligent chatbots, if you want to call them? Um, I think it's, for that particular use case, the evolution has been slower than, than people would have liked. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that even in the, you know, a decade ago, there was a lot of um, news about like IBM Watson learning how to become a chess master and um, or being a Jeopardy champion. And so there's a lot of written about, hey, how smart can these uh, computers and artificial intelligences become? And, and if you look objectively at, at real life consumer applications, we really haven't seen a ton of, of, of advancements. So, I mean, I mean, I think let's be fair. So many people have some sort of device at home now, either an Amazon Alexa device or a Google Home Assistant um, or Siri uh, for their for the iPhone. And those have come a long way, but you really can't have much of a conversation with those. You know, um, I did a poll recently asking people, how do you, you know, what do you rely on these artificial intelligence personal assistants for? A lot of it was, you know, to play music or to do home security or maybe get, you know, see what the weather is like. Um, it's sort of a very finite, limited number of use cases where those things can shine. But anything more complex, they still struggle. And these are companies spending a ton of money in, in um, R&D trying to develop that. So mm -hmm. if you think about why, so my short answer, I, I don't want to go on and on on this, but I think the Short answer to your question is that it hasn't really developed as fast as people would have liked. And if you ask yourself, why is that for, for FAQ type of bots, you know, it's, it's because you really need tens of millions, if not more people talking to that bot about sort of the same thing for it to get smart. And um, there's very few use cases where that actually happens. Um, so if you, if you're at, uh, if you're a uh, technical person and you actually go look at like the, um, you know, the, the, the Amazon, um, you know, bot framework uh, SDK, or if you go look at the IBM Watson SDK and you, you can see, you can understand how the artificial intelligence and the machine learning can work, but it really relies on a huge amount of interactions for it to get smarter. And there's just not a ton of use cases where that's happening in L and D that's even more pronounced where, you can't really think of a use case where you're going to have tens of millions of people asking about the same thing or around the same topic. And so I think that's a stopper right now. So, yeah, it'll take time and maybe it won't evolve to that stage very rapidly. I mean, if it's not happening for general use cases, it may not happen for L and D pretty soon. Right. Could I think that's be, a fair assessment. Could there be artificially created situations for this? I'm just, extrapolating, you know, just to ensure that the chatbot can learn on its own. Can there be the artificial set of questions that are put in 
which helps the chatbot learn better? I mean, is there something like that which people may have tried? Yeah, I think that there's uh, several areas where artificial intelligence can be imply, applied to L&D that could be very interesting and, and applicable right away. You know, one of them is um, tackling the, the content issue. So, um, you know, there's an increasingly a, a huge amount of content that a learner might want to have access to. Um, and, and that's both content that maybe you as an organization are creating, but also YouTube or Google, you know, um, and so having some artificial intelligence um, aggregate content that, you know, is applicable, um, organize it, present it, um, I think is that that's a really interesting use case. Um, I think also applying artificial intelligence to the promise of adaptive learning is really interesting. So um, can you create a learner profile that learns about my skill level, my knowledge set, my job function, maybe my personal goals with my manager, and then adapts a learning journey just for me. Um, and so I think that those, those are two use cases that I think are underserved in the market that I see, mm -hmm. um, that, I, that I think are big opportunities for artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So uh, Vince, let's move on to the next area, which is possibly related to what you do at Mobile Code. You know, so there are chatbots which can proactively nudge or remind learners on their mobile devices, which is probably the most important function chatbots can play. Uh, you know, could you share more about that? Yeah, so the, the way that I like to think about it is a chatbot has two modes. Uh, in the FAQ scenario, which we've spent a lot of time talking about, that's a passive mode where the chatbot's waiting 24 hours a day yeah. for any time to, for someone who wants to engage with it, ask it a question or something like that. Um, the second mode is a, a push mode where the chatbot's gonna initiate some interaction. Um, and I think that's a mode that has a lot of potential today for L&D folks. And so sending messages to remind, to hold people accountable, give people updates, um, you know, to, to automate those types of things, I, I think can be really interesting. And so that's where uh, a lot of work that we do, we, we, we support both because even on the, on the passive side, um, there are fun things you can do for performance support, like, you know, helping people find job aids or like an acronym chatbot can be really interesting or sort of an HR supported chatbot can be interesting. On the push side though, you can do things like training reinforcement, um, you can imagine sort of journeys that help a new hire onboard uh, more effectively. Um, anywhere, so, so sort of this use case where do you have a scenario where uh, you're putting someone in a situation where you're hooking them up to a fire hose and they're, you're giving them way too much content that they can possibly you know, ingest in the time that you're, you, you have them. Well, instead of doing that, which is not very effective, you know, drip that content over time through a chatbot. And so... Um, reinforcement onboarding is a great one. We're also seeing um, user experiences where people are replacing required compliance e-learning courses, mm -hmm. you know, which is sort of this idea of, gosh, you know, I really have to sit here and watch this 25 minute e-learning. I'm going to try to cheat as much as I can and maybe multitask and just guess on the quizzes so I can just get it over with. You know, a lot of people aren't really learning much uh, in that type of user experience. And so can you take some sort of dry security required compliance course and turn that into a fun chatbot experience with a little bit of gamification and um, let people do it on their own time um, on Microsoft Teams or on WhatsApp or something like that. So we're seeing some pretty creative use cases of that type of modality for chatbots that um, I think uh, can be really interesting, um, both from this perspective of the benefit to the organization, as well as the type of engagement that a learner can have. Hmm. Very interesting. I think there are several uh, follow-up questions that I would have on that. Uh, the first one, you know, does it ever get annoying for people? You know, it's too invasive or can they set parameters themselves? Yeah, I think that, um, again, I think that's the des a design challenge to make sure that when you're deciding to push a message proactively via a chatbot, that it's going to feel valuable to the to the learner, um, you you can measure that in a couple of ways. Um, you can create 
the functionality in the chatbot to, to allow people to opt out, which I think should be in every chatbot. Okay. So if a lot of people are opting out, then that's a signal to you that this was not <laughs> a very good user experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then qualitatively, you can ask people, have the chat, you know, what's a wonderful thing about a chatbot, it is a, it is a natural survey tool because it's just a conversation. So imagine a chatbot's giving you some tips for a couple of weeks and then one day it texts you like, hey, Amit, I've been sending you some messages the last couple of weeks. Which ones have felt valuable? Which ones haven't? What do you think about this user experience? And what I find is that people are actually more honest interacting with a chatbot giving feedback than having to go to some survey monkey and quickly trying to fill out a survey. And so you have some inputs there both quantitative, are people opting out, are people responding, and qualitative to help you feel confident that your push chatbot's gonna add value and not feel invasive or annoying. Hmm, fantastic. I mean, that's, that's very helpful. And it, it kind of you know, uh, does it in terms of uh, how you structure it from the design stage and to the measurement stage. So you can kind of close the loop if you, if you wish to, based on the feedback that you're getting. And that, that's a very important point about survey because I, I can completely imagine, you know, sending out a form to 100 people or 200 people or 500 people at one go, instead of a message coming to you with your name, how do you feel can be absolutely, you know, very personal. You do feel like responding to that. Yeah. Absolutely. And the other thing I'll say about this is that, you know, I've been building software for 30 years and um, from my first days in technology, the idea of A-B testing was, was always sort of an altruistic, hey, we have to do this. But in practice, very rarely does, rarely does anyone do it because it's so expensive and difficult to do. But with a chatbot, it's very easy to do because you're not having to render a new version. Like if you were to try to do an A-B test with an app, you have to somehow like create two versions of the app. And then if you want to make an update, you have to push those updates and then people have to accept those updates. I mean, it's a whole, it's a whole um, ordeal. But with a chatbot, you can do things like, hey, I'm gonna, for this group here, I'm just gonna send a message at 10 a.m. And for this group over here, I'll send the message at 2 p.m. and we'll compare the results. Yeah. And there's no software that you have to render or anything like that. So there's a lot of great A-B testing you can do. Again, to this point of, of um, you know, your questions are really important question of let's make sure it's not annoying or invasive. And my point is that there's a lot of tools with chatbots that you can, you can sort of configure to, to give you some confidence that it, it's adding value. Hmm. Fantastic. My other uh, follow-up question to your previous response uh, was around compliance e-learning. That sounds very interesting. I mean, have you seen real use cases of organizations ditching their compliance e-learning and moving on to a chatbot in a you know, spaced out, nuggetized format, maybe on Teams or through any other medium. But have you really yeah, seen- we're Yeah, seeing, we're seeing some pilots right now. Okay. Um, I don't know if I've seen anyone wholesale switch it over. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, if there are folks that are doing it, but uh, yeah, we're seeing, we're involved in a couple of pilots right now. Um, and I think it's inevitable um, just because um, we're, we're we're in an increase, whether we like it or not, we're an increase, we are in an increasingly regulated world <laughs> with laws and, and, um, and, and there's some real consequences if, if people in our organization don't understand and live by those laws. And so one, one really, one fun example that I can think of, I mean, you might enjoy this is a project where someone's creating a chat, but to try to trick employees to giving up personal information. Mm. And, and so this is an initiative to say, hey, we got to get our employees smarter about recognizing phishing attempts because we all know that when a, a major corporation is taken down by a hacker or a, fisher, uh, a, you know, a phishing attempt, it's devastating. And a lot of times those on entry points are coming through vulnerable employees who are giving up information they, that they shouldn't. So imagine a chatbot, it's actually a fun instructional design exercise to say, can I design a chat, but to try to trick a meet into telling me what his birthday is or, you know, what his mother's maiden name is, you know? Um, and so you can, that's one project that I, I know of that I think is really interesting and uh, an example of, of how to, how to tackle some, some of these um, compliance yeah. training and uh, use cases. Yeah, no, I, I can completely uh, imagine how it will be a great uh, add-on to a, 
compliance training program. If you, you know, supplement it and kind of do it on a surprise basis, every three months, six months, just run it and see how many people fall for it. I mean, <laughs> I have to say somebody in our organization fell for something like this uh, six months ago, you know, they got a mail and uh, they were requested to transfer some money because I was in a meeting or something and they transferred. Wow. Wow. And, 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 that's, and, that's yeah, and they didn't even check. And so they, they fell for that. So luckily it wasn't a huge amount of money, but still any money lost is lost. But yeah, you're right. You know, the best test is in, in when you are not ready for it, especially for the such things. In a, in a test environment, after a course, you know what you're going to be asked. Fantastic. Exactly. There was another point I had, which was around, is there a reference that we can draw from some of these health related chatbots? Because there are a few that have come around who are essentially nudging you, you know, every day, every well, after you set a frequency, but then, you know, they would ask you, how are you feeling today? And, you know, then they possibly advise you a few things. So is there a bigger example out there because of course lnd is a little localized and within an organization so the the data points may be a little limited but for things like that which are going to across organizations and possibly thousands and millions of people are they also a good reference point for some of these nudge or push based uh, chatbots yeah probably the health arenas where chatbots have the the biggest audience outside of FAQ chatbots. Um, so yeah, that's a really astute observation. Um, and so we can learn a lot from these health related chatbots, people reminding or health coaches that are chatbots that are holding me accountable to a weight loss program or to working out every day or um, just eating better and being more conscious of what I'm eating. Um, and what I could, and so, this is an area I'm also very passionate about. And, and actually that's how mobile coach got started is by creating health related chatbots. Oh. Um, and I think um, our, an important point here is, you know, I meet earlier, you asked, well, don't people, isn't there a risk that people will find interacting with a chatbot annoying or invasive? Yeah. You know, and we talked a lot about that, but on the, on the reverse side, there are cases where people would prefer to talk to a chatbot than a human. And in the, and the reference point in health is a great example of that because um, one, one area where people are more comfortable with a chatbot is when the content is sensitive. Like I may not wanna tell you a meat how much I weigh <laughs> or that yesterday I ate three pieces of chocolate cake and I don't wanna, that might be embarrassing, but I might feel more comfortable talking to a chatbot and telling them that so I can get some real advice. Now, so in L and D, how does that translate? Well, are there cases where people are going to be more comfortable talking with a chatbot than a human being in an L&D scenario? And, and what we found that, that there are, I'll give you one example. Mm -hmm. So let's say that I'm a new employee and you're my manager. And, mm -hmm. um, and I, you've spent an hour with me explaining some policy or explaining some task that I need to do. And I know you're a very busy man. And so I say, Amit, thank you so much for spending an hour explaining this to me. And you're trying to be a great manager. So you say, no problem, Vince. Do you really understand it? And I tell you, I understand it, but in my mind, I'm saying, I don't understand it. Am I gonna ask you again? Probably not, because that puts it makes me feel vulnerable. Like maybe my manager will think I'm not smart or not up to the task or that puts my job at risk. And so that's a great example where, well, I can ask a chatbot 10 times to explain something to me and I'm gonna feel pretty safe. And so there are cases like that where um, that you know can be learned from the health chatbot user experiences that we can bring into L and D to make the experience more valuable for learners. Hmm. Excellent point, Vince. And and you know one of them, of course, ties back to the survey point that you said earlier about people are more honest in those surveys. And similarly, over here, they may feel that you know I can give you know my thoughts on if I've not understood, I've not understood, and you know maybe they're not associating a lot of human uh, characteristics to the chatbot. So they are saying, you know, it doesn't matter. You know? And at the same time, they are willing to share, you know, their deepest of secrets, if you want to call them. They are feeling that it is a confidant they have. So they it won't leak it out to anyone. You know, a person, you can always have that doubt whether they will tell the other person 
So maybe you're not so sure, but with this, with the, with the chatbot kind of thing, you may want to. The, so that's kind of building a very, you know, a strange kind of relationship, relationship with a chatbot. You know, you know it's not human, but you also feel that it's your, you know, best friend in keeping secrets. So some, something, something unique is happening there. Yeah, definitely. And and if that's resonating with anyone listening to this podcast, it's important that you are transparent. I think it's important that you are very transparent to your audience, to your, your corporate audience of what your privacy policy is and to make sure that, that your chatbot infrastructure is going to adhere to that private privacy policy. So for example, if I'm confiding in my chatbot, but know in the back of my mind, my manager has access to what I'm saying, that that's a very different dynamic. If I know it's truly anonymous and truly private, then there's a, there's huge, uh, benefit to that. There's also benefit to having reports, and you know every organization that I want when they invest in technology, they want to see reports. And so, I think when you start your chatbot project, that should be part of the agenda of the project plan. What's our privacy policy? How do we, you know, what's the pros and cons of making it purely anonymous or getting some data, and how do we communicate that to the users so that they are confident that we're acting in their best interest? And so. That might not be an obvious part of a chatbot project, but I think it's an important part of whatever project you, you start kicking off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very important point. Uh, so, if an organization has obviously a good privacy policy, but at the same time, I think it's fair to assume that the management would want to still get a, a sense of what people are, you know, going through, feeling, you know, or worried about. So, let's say they want to measure stress. And if they find that the chatbot results are really showing that a lot of people are stressed, so they can take some corrective measures possibly. So in a way, collated data, which is anonymized to a, to a large extent, would still be useful. So maybe there's a balance that they need to strike and which would be part of their privacy policy itself. Uh, that's a, a spot on. And, and, there, and maybe, um, you know, maybe there's enough advantage in not having any sort of anonymity so that you wanna see these things, but you just communicate that to the user and let them decide how much they wanna engage. And one of the biggest advantages of not having anonymity is being able to proactively mitigate um, you know, risk factors before they happen. So mm -hmm. I was just in a meeting this week with a company that has a huge employee turnover problem. Um, I don't know what it's like in your area of the world, but in the United States, you know, the job market is such where lots of people are just, you know, it's, a, it's very friendly for, for employees right now. They can make lots of choices. And so there's this big turn turnover problem and turnover is costing this organization a lot of money. And when someone's decided to leave, it's too late. And so are there ways that the chatbot can help sense indicators uh, before that decision's made and so that you can come in and, and uh, remediate. And so, um, you know, so for example, you might ask on someone's on week one, hey, you know, on a scale of one to 10, um, how has your manager been doing? And, you know, if it's a poor score, that might be an indicator that this person's at risk. And so you can sort of intervene. And so use cases like that, you wouldn't want anim anonymity because you want to be able to see how's this person doing so that we can help them be successful. Yeah, 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 brilliant idea as well there. You know, of course, uh, there is a challenge. So India is going through a similar challenge. It's a great situation for job seekers at this time. Uh, and I, I was trying to juxtapose this with uh, some sort of a pulse survey that organizations do. We are beginning our own uh, soon, which is like a quarterly survey of people with uh, you know, 10, 12 questions, which just gives us a pulse of what people are feeling, what people are going through you know, on some of those parameters that have been identified. But maybe there's an opportunity to see if a chatbot can support some of those people who you identify may not be doing as well. You know, so may not be from the pulse survey because that would be completely anonymous, but some way. So, I'm just trying to you know, merge the two ideas. So if you're kind of taking a dipstick in quarter one and you find 10% people have a challenge, those are the people the chatbot can support a little better if, if that's the logic that you build in. I love that idea. It's sort of like creating an interactive job aid for people are, are, you know, and so I can imagine taking the pulse survey, having it be completely anonymized, but 
after I finish it, having some results page that says, hey, by the way, here are five chatbots that are for you to, to, to opt into if you want. You know, one might be, you know, how do I um, more effectively connect with my manager? Or, you know, how do I, uh, I uh, how, you know, maybe people are struggling with a commute. And so there's, or maybe someone's struggling with mental health. And, you know, so all these different options that you can create as a, as a service mm-hmm. and people can opt into the buckets that apply to them. It's a brilliant idea. Yeah, just just thinking aloud and bringing in what you just said, it just struck me. Maybe there yeah, some there's something for you to work on. I think. Uh, let let me let me. Note. <laughs> no good. I think uh, I'm happy that uh, it's an idea that resonates. Uh, there was another area that I wanted to check with you. I mean, you talked about a couple of examples uh, in in kind of uh, brief. Is there a more elaborate example that you can share for anybody who's listening to this podcast, especially from L&D side, that they can take back and reflect on and possibly think about, yes, they can do something like this? I think the most simple, there's two very simple examples that I think are easy to try and implement if someone wants to get a taste of it. We've already talked about one, I've alluded to one, but it's new, new hire onboarding. So take your existing onboarding material imagine chopping it up over 30 days and just creating, it's almost like a drip campaign. Day Mm -hmm. one, this is the message. Day two, this is the message. You don't even have to have it be very fancy. Um, um, You know, you don't have to create a lot of branching scenarios, just have it be uh, over the first month and then measure and and qualitatively ask the new hire, you know, how, whether, whether it was helpful, whether it helped them acclimate to their job. I think it's easy to build, easy to deploy, and easy to get some immediate feedback, mm-hmm. just so that you can test the modality of a chatbot to say, is this something that our organization would want to leverage and get better at and, and have more sophisticated use cases? So that's one that's very easy. The second one is training reinforcement. So mm-hmm. take some existing, and, and what's nice about this one is that you're not having to create new content. So take some existing training initiative or program um, you know, and then create um, a, a, a reminder user experience. Again, maybe it's just 30 days or it's quite simple where you're trying to mitigate the forget, forgetting curve. You know, so someone goes through a training um, and then you program the chatbot to be smart about the content of that training and you divide it up. And you can even maybe ask the person, hey, what's your goal? Tell me how you're going to implement this training in your job. And I'll follow up with you in a couple of weeks to see how it's going. So almost part reminder, part survey, um, easy, to, pretty, pretty straightforward to build. And again, gives you some instant feedback just to test this modality. Yeah. Um, you know, is this again, if, because a lot of organizations have never done chatbots for L and D. And so you got to find an easy way to get in there to, to show. And if you can show, you remember at the very beginning of when we started talking, I talked about the biggest problem that I think chatbots are solving for L and D is learner engagement. And so if in these sort of simple use cases, you can see, hey, we're actually reaching these people. They're answering the chatbot. And um, and just compare that to whether they're answering emails or even opening the emails, that can be an easy win for an L&D person who is looking for a better engagement path. That sounds very interesting. And I think both of them are, you know, very doable things uh, for L&D. In fact, you know, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, uh, we are doing a lot or talking a lot on the, you know, retrieval practice area, which is reinforcement of learning after a, a big dump has happened, you know, whether it is a one hour program or a three day ILD or whatever, but most people don't retain and that forgetting curve is really uh, present for a lot of people in different, uh, you know, philosophy, but uh, some people forget very quickly, some will forget after a little while, but yeah, a little bit of reinforcement can help. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in the reinforcement, but maybe I'll follow up with you after that, after this, this as well. But, you know, both of these things, uh, do you want to take a step further and suggest how can they go about doing it? So maybe mobile coach is one option. Are there other options? What would you suggest in terms of tools and capability that LND needs to have, or they can maybe rely on a vendor, but at least they understand that this is what 
they will need to get started with yeah. even these two kind of scenarios. Yeah. So the first question to ask yourself is, what, where do I want this chatbot to be? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, is it Microsoft Teams? Is it on WhatsApp? Is it on, you know, SMS? Is it online or Telegram or something like that? So that's the first question to ask yourself because that's going to inform what tool is available for you. Um, so you ask yourself that question and then based on the channel, then you can investigate how to build a chatbot. So there are generally two ways to build a chatbot depending on the, the channel that you choose. One is very technical. So a lot of these channels have software development kits or SDKs as they're called, where an engineer can come in and read all the documentation and set up all the messaging. So it's a little bit of a heavier lift. Um, you get the benefit because they're fully integrated but you do need to rely on some engineer or software developer to go in and, and sort that out for you. Um, then the other way is to use a vendor um, like Mobile Coach. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the vision behind Mobile Coach is we know that a lot of organizations aren't gonna have the luxury of having engineers available, especially in L&D. And so to use a tool like um, Mobile Coach, which is an authoring platform, um, where you can go in and author your messages and say, okay, day one, here's the message I want to send. And day three, here's the message that I want to send. And in the mobile coach platform, you can turn on Telegram or turn on Microsoft Teams or SMS. And so we support all those different channels. Um, there are other authoring tools available out there based on the modality. So if you want like to use Facebook, for example, there are a handful of Facebook authoring tools but they're only going to be for Facebook. And um, there are a couple other tools that maybe support a couple channels. Um, and so, yeah, there's, um, it's still a very evolving market. So there's not a ton of choices right now, other than those two big categories. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in the coming years, we'll start to see more and more. Hmm, fantastic. So of course you are early in the game and, and I, I really hope that you make it big with mobile coach. You know, it's, it's you. an area, as I said, it's it's gaining traction. It's been in the trending list for, for almost ages, sounds like ages. Uh, uh, in fact, you know, uh, if you could share a link where people can go and check out Mobile Coach, if there is a demo online, if you can share it with me, we can plug it into the you know platforms where we put this podcast. Uh, but just a quick question, because, uh, you know, this is something that we discussed internally at Upside Learning with our team a little while ago about this something called google dialogue flow mm -hmm. i'm sure you would know <laughs> i don't know much but is that a tool or is that just a technology I, i'm sorry it's I'm a just, tool not... <laughs> okay yep it's a tool and it's a it's quite it's a nice tool and it, it also supports multiple channels and it's sort of like a blend of of configuration and there are advanced engine uh, tools and pieces of it that need developers, but it's possible for someone that's not a developer to use Dialogflow. Dialogflow is, is um, more of, um, you know, it's, it's more of, of creating these FAQ chatbots that have some machine learning behind them um, and less catered to some of these more programmatic campaign style chatbots. But yeah, that's, they're, they're a great tool. Google has some really, really great technology behind them. Fantastic. Any last bits of advice for LMB if they get excited by chatbots? Of course, you know their first port of call has to be mobile coach, and I'll, I'll look forward to that link so that they can you know understand. Uh, but yeah, anything that you would want to share for LMB who are willing to get started with this? Yeah, I think that um, that the the big the big exciting opportunity as well as the biggest challenge for LMB people. Is, is in the instructional design of a chatbot. So you know, I think that instructional design for years has been very you know, e-learning sort of based or, or creating instructor-led experiences. Um, and so the idea of creating a conversational learning experience is quite different. Um, so, but I think it's really exciting because the possi possibilities are, are so new. So typically, in, in instructional design, we've had to live in a box of that's time bound where, hey, you're going to have this three hour workshop. So you got to make sure the instructor has, you know, it's going to have some really great tools and experiences for just those three hours. Or 
we're gonna we have this one hour e-learning course and so let's make our slides look really let's put some really good music in there and keep it entertaining great but for a chatbot you can have experiences that last a year and so that i think is really exciting opens up a lot of possibility to be creative but it is also it is also very new um so i think it, you know for this audience to start thinking about and imagining what those user experiences can be, can be really fun daydreaming <laughs> or brainstorming. And if you find yourself getting excited about the possibilities, then you know I think this is a definitely an, an area that is worth investing in because it, it is the future. It's gonna be a huge part of the future of learning. Well, I completely agree. And I think, uh, you know, you rightly said that you know, instructional design can sometimes get itself boxed into those 30 minute, one hour, three day programs. Even though we pretty well understand that nobody really captures anything after maybe 10, 15 minutes because they're just so full. And especially if it is a new topic, they just can't absorb anything beyond that. So there's this sound logic to break it down and make it nuggetized and space it out. Maybe chatbots is a, a good answer to that, which is by default nuggetized. You know, the, the structure is that it is nuggetized by default. If you program it well, it can serve that purpose very well. I totally agree. And I love that term. I'm gonna, I've taken some notes today, Amit, and nuggetized is gonna enter into my vocabulary now. I love that. <laughs> Fantastic. Vince, it has been a pleasure. I have learned so much today. Thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge. You've been doing a fantastic job with Mobile Coach. I, I looked up your website to understand a little bit. But yeah, I look forward to the link again. And thank you so much once again. Thanks for having me. It was really fun. I appreciated the conversation. My pleasure. <laughs>